Welcome to today's webinar. Our topic today will be the changes in Power Over Ethernet and a data center testing update in light of where a lot of the new networking standards are going to. My name is Wayne Allen and I'm the product marketing engineer for Fluke Networks in the Asia Pacific region and I will be your host for today's webinar. The first topic we'll have a look at today is new standards that are going to be influencing networking going forward. And as you will see, the emphasis is on more speed and greater bandwidth. The graphic I have here comes from the Ethernet Alliance people, and this is how they see technology, where we are today and where we're heading. The inner circle there, uh, 2018 to 2020 is where we are today. And the outer circle is where they see things heading in the future. Over on the left, the slower speeds, and across on the right, the higher speeds. So in industrial automation, lower speeds are, are common, but they see people moving to higher speeds in the future, especially as industrial ethernet uh, starts to come to the fore replacing some of the field bus technologies. Automotive, we already have 100 megabits and one gigabit links in vehicles, but they see that going faster. Uh, 1000 gig is probably where we are today. And most new cars, especially if they uh, have a high level of automation, have up to 200 Ethernet nodes on board, linking the computers, um, engine management, transmissions, sensors for autonomous vehicles, lane departure warnings. They're all running on Ethernet in modern vehicles. If you look at our enterprise space, our campus and data center areas, uh, one gig to 10 gig has been the normal and people are moving up they're moving up to 10 gig to 50 gig and moving forward towards 100 gig. Our cloud providers, these are the hyperscale data centers. They're already at that 100 gig stage, but are looking to move to 400 gig. And the needle there is pegged at 400 gig, which is where we are today. Going forward, service providers, co-location, um, Think of uh, telco companies providing mobile and fixed services. They're going to need more speed. They're in the 100 to 400 gigabits per second at the moment, but looking to move up through 800 gigabits out to 1.6 terabytes. On the previous slide, I mentioned that we're looking to go a lot higher in speed. So this is from the Ethernet Alliance, as you can see on the graphic there across on the right. And this is their roadmap. Now today, standards bodies have completed their 400 gigabits per second work. So all the little dots there, all green, the speeds available and we're ready to go. And this graphic combines both cop up and fiber speeds there. So the next step is to move to 800 gigabits and 1.6 terabytes. You might have seen this uh, news line in a couple of the uh, networking press. This is from uh, data center information. It's been in fiber optic information. But very recently, Nokia Bell Labs transmitted 1.52 terabytes over 80 kilometers of standard single mode fiber. So as you can see, work is progressing really quickly to go to these higher speeds. The Ethernet Alliance has mapped out what the speeds will look like, as you can see, and roughly when, plus the interfaces they will use. And I think what we'll see in the future is a lot more single mode especially in some of the hyperscale data centers. And that then leads to a lot more parallel optics because parallel optics are the future to achieve these speeds. 
let's have a look at some of those 400 gigabits per second standards that have just been published. And let's start with the 802.3 CM standard, which is for multi-mode. And the first one here is the 400 gigabits base SR8. SR's short range, that, that fits with multi-mode fiber. The eight, eight pairs of multi-mode fiber. So therefore we're looking at 16 fibers in total. And to run this, you'll be looking at utilizing the new Focus 18 MPO connector. Uh, the Focus 18 connector allows 16 fibers or 32 fibers. And over on the right there, by way of contrast, I have the 12 fiber connector that we're used to, and underneath it, the new 16 fiber connector. You'll notice the uh, different arrangement for the pins and the different keyway, keyways so that you can't mix these two connectors up. Length with multi-mode is always an issue. So for OM3, 70 meters, OM4, OM5 cable, 100 meters. Importantly, the la this lanes break out to support 50 gigabit, 100 gigabit and 200 gigabit using a single pair for 50 gig, two pairs for 100 gig and four pairs for 200 gigabit. Because it's MPO based, the test standards are being revised to support MPO field testing so that you can make certain your fiber meets the transmission requirements. Because critical here is channel loss. So that's a maximum of 1.8 dB. I want to emphasize here, this is channel, not link. So if you're connecting multiple links together to form a channel, multiple links must be less than 1.8 dB. The other interesting one here is the 400G uh, base SR4.2. So that's pronounced 4.2. So there's four pairs of multi-mode fiber. But interestingly, the dot two is two wavelengths per, per pair. And that's utilizing the 840 nanometer and 940 nanometer wavelengths. 70 meters on OM3 cable with 1.8 dB of channel budget. 100 meters on OM4 cable with a 1.9 dB of channel budget. And interestingly on OM5, 150 meters, 2 dB of channel budget. So this is utilizing the optimization of OM5 at multiple wavelengths. And I'll have a little bit more about this as we go further through this presentation. I mentioned on the previous slide that we could break down the speeds. So IEEE 802.3 CD is the 50 gigabit, 100 gigabit, 200 gigabit Ethernet standards. So these are the FIs, and we have both multi-mode and single mode available at these speeds. Multi-mode, short range, 100 meters, Single mode, at least two kilometers with lengths up to 10 kilometers. 100 gigabits, same sort of deal, but with single mode, it's a duplex, so it's two fibers, uh, at least 500 meters. And at the moment, 200 gigabits is a multi-mode standard. And again, limited to 100 meters on OM4, OM5 cable. So, if we have a look at what's available for multi-mode fiber connectivity, I've got a summary here of some of the currently available types. Uh, it's not everything. I haven't gone down below 10 gigabits per second. But as you can see here, ranging from 10 gigabits up to 400 gigabits, the existing 400 gigabit standard was SR16, 32 fibers. But I think what we need to realize here is the fiber counts. Importantly, be very cognizant of the link length and look at the channel budgets that we have available here. Those channel budgets are going to be pretty tough. So if you look at that, you think, oh, that, that might be fairly easy, but not really. 
if you look at the 40 gigabits OM, on OM485 as 150 meters, uh, 1.5 dB of insertion loss maximum, two connectors based on TIA or ISO standard um, is already at a dB. So you haven't really got a lot of room there to play around with. Importantly, we can't ignore single mode. Um, single mode's got a very bright future as far as Ethernet applications go going forward. And as you saw earlier on there, they're already demonstrating 1.52 terabytes on single mode fiber. So one of the key things with premises cabling, data center cabling and things like that is to move single mode fiber beyond the current 10 kilometer limit. So you have 802.3cn, uh, sort of mirrors where multi-mode was, 50 gigabit, 200 gigabit, 400 gigabits on single mode fiber beyond 10 kilometers. And that um, standard has already been published. So you've got those speeds, but I think what's really interesting is the distances out to 40 kilometers. So that's quite a long reach on single mode. Now, the other important part to realize here is your maximum channel loss is 18 dB. So that looks large, just as I said with some of the um, multi-mode fibers, but reality, you don't have a lot to play with. If you take 40 kilometers of cable, uh, let's say OS2 type cable, uh, 0.4 of a dB per kilometer, 40 kilometers, you're already at 16 dB just in the fiber. And you haven't added your connectors and your splices yet. So that sort of channel loss is, uh, is what we call an, an engineered channel. And that 18 dB uh, you have, is, is tough and you're going to be really have to be really careful with your installation techniques. And that means testing is going to be important. So you're going to be testing at 13, 10 nanometers and 15, nan 15, 50 nanometers. And the 15, 50, even though it's not an operational wavelength in some cases, uh, faults tend to ter turn up at the longer wavelength. So testing at both wavelengths will be very important to ensure these applications work over these distances. And you're looking at a light source power meter to make these measurements rather than an OTDR, because an OTDR is just a little bit too generous or optimistic in its reading. And to go even further, if you look down the bottom on this, of the page here, they've even got a standard available now using dense wave division multiplexing that will take signal mode speeds up to 400 gigabits over 80 kilometers of fiber. From the Ethernet Alliance side, I also have uh, a little diagram there that just shows you the different styles of modulations, the speeds that can be achieved using combinations of um, fibers. So these are lanes or, or pairs of fiber. So you get an insight there by adjusting from modulation and adding fibers through how we can achieve speeds down a channel. So like I did with multi-mode, I have a slide here on single mode. So these are some of the, the standards that are starting to kick around on single mode fiber from 40 gigabit to 400 gigabit. So you can see the designations there, the amount of lanes the application uses and that translates to a fiber count. Link lengths, uh, channel loss, and importantly, reflectance. Now reflectance at higher speeds is becoming more important, uh, especially around connectors, uh, your hygiene on connectors, cleanliness, directly affects reflectance. So you're going to need to look at reflectance when you're testing links for these sort of speeds. Uh, an OTDR is great for looking at 
reflectance. Also channel loss, just like you saw on the previous slide. Uh, channel loss, it appears generous. And if we look at 100 gigabits there in the middle, 6.3 dB, uh, 10 kilometers of cable, 10 kilometers of OS2 is 4 dB already. Two connectors, 0.75 of a dB per connector. So we're up at 5.5 dB. Um, say we pigtail spliced, uh, that's 0.6 of a dB for the two splices. We're already at 6.1 dB. So although that looks generous, you will have to pay attention to your testing and to make certain that your installation workmanship is good so that you can beat these sorts of channel budgets. Not to leave copper out of the equation, copper is still very important and will play a large role in our networks going forward, especially if you start to consider power over ethernet. So the copper landscape, or what we call the base T landscape at the moment, if you're looking at uh, a standard channel of 100 meters across the enterprise floor, you know, office spaces and things like that. You've got a choice of a gigabit. You've got 2.5, 5 gigabit, M base T as they say, which is a subset of the 10 gigabit standard. If you look at the data center on copper, you've also now got the choice of 25 gigabit or 40 gigabit. And of course, that's using category eight cabling, more designed for row based technologies, middle of row, end of row, or rack based technologies, top of rack. So as we go faster, the distance goes lower in copper, but copper is not going to go away. It, it, it's here to stay, and we need to consider that as part of our structured cabling mix. So we have these new applications, new network speeds becoming available to us to use in our networks. But key to get them operational is to make certain we're supporting these new speeds with testing. So let's have a look at some of the changes in the cabling standards. And I'll focus on the TIA standards here because I know India likes to use TIA standards. And the overall generic telecommunications standard is the TIA 568.0 standard. And over the years, there's been a number of, of amend, amendments being made. Recently, single balanced twisted pair use cases and topologies have been added. You might hear the term SPE, single pair ethernet being used. So this sort of technology has been added to the mix for generic cabling. And where the TIA is heading with the 568 standards is they're now looking at developing an E version. So for a long, long while we were using the B and we moved to the C version. Then, believe it or not, five years ago, we started to move to the D versions. And that five year review cycle is up and now we're starting to move to the E versions. And it follows for commercial building standards. There are a number of addendums for 568.1. The .1-T-1 was the first addendum and again, updated for new media types. And they're now moving the 568.1 standard out to the E versions. The TIA 568.2D standard, that's the balanced twisted pair cabling standard uh, that we refer to quite a lot in our industry, uh, had a number of amend uh, amendments brought about over the last couple of years. And uh, probably the key one there is the second one there, the dash D.2, and that's power delivery over balanced twisted pair cabling. That addresses how to deliver POE over twisted pair cabling, and especially in the smaller gauge cables, 26 gauge, 28 gauge patch cords, and, and what you need to do 
to um, cable to meet power over Ethernet requirements. For fibre optics, it's the 568.3 standard. Again, a number of addendums have been published, general updates, some changes in the test limits, the .3-D-1 limit has moved multi-mode testing from 0.3 of a dB for the first and last connector to 0.5 of a dB for the first and last connector. And that's in line with the ISO people. And again, with the fiber optics, they're looking to move towards an E edition. And there's a new standard, the TIA 568.5 standard, and this addresses single twisted pair cabling components. So that's the connectors and the cables used for single pair Ethernet. So that's work in progress, and that should be quite an interesting standard, especially for IoT devices in the ICT world and IIoT devices in the industrial automation world. I mentioned earlier on an earlier slide that there will also be some new fiber connection interfaces to deal with. And I borrowed this from the Ethernet Alliance. It's a, it's a great resource tool to find out what's happening with Ethernet. And as we go faster, we want more bandwidth. And so that's forcing a change in interface electronics. We want more density in our con connectivity options. So as you saw earlier, we have a new MPO connector, the F Focus 18 connector for 16 or 32 fibers. And there's a, recently there's been another connector that's starting to, to be adopted out there, and that's called the CS connector. And that's to support QSFP double density and OSFP interfaces. And it's also used in SFP double density um, connectivity. So I, I have a selection there, uh, the CS connector uh, over there on the left-hand side. And the IEC, these are the component level people, they've also approved the SN connector and the MDC connector. So both the CS and the SN connector are from Senko and the MDC is from US Connect. And you can see the density uh, changes there, the graphic I have in the middle of that slide. Um, there's a typical LC duplex connector that we use today. And alongside there, the CS connector, and alongside the CS connector, the SN connector. So as you can see, a lot more density, you can pack more connectors in there for the same space. With new connectors, it's important that your test instrumentation can support that. So with the change of interfaces, uh, testing has to change as well. And with the current advanced equipment that's uh, available today on the market, you can quite easily adapt the connectivity to allow you to test uh, CS type connectors as I've got here in this graphic. Moving away from fiber optics and back to copper, with some of the changes we're seeing in the standards today, we've actually got some new link configurations we need to understand and, and make certain we're dealing with with correctly if, when we go to, to do testing. So if we look at wireless access points and IP cameras uh, as an example, Typically, the far end is hardwired with an RJ45 plug. And in the past, that's sort of been a frowned upon as a standards-based approach, but a very common uh, approach for CCTV cameras and wireless access points. And the key here is those plugs on the end are field terminated plugs. And a word of warning, Common, low-cost, cheap, crimp-on, clear plastic plugs, just not going to really make the grade when we're, we're talking about these sort of uh, terminations. 
And most of the leading vendors have new filled terminated plugs available for this particular application. The question here is, is this a permanent link or a channel test to test this? Because we have a jack at one end at the patch panel and we have an RJ45 plug out in the field. It's, it's neither. So we need to consider that. So today in the TIA standard, uh, in the .2-D standard, it's called a modular plug terminated link, or MPTL for short. And it's listed in Annex F of the standard. And ISO is following a similar path. Uh, they have a document 14763-4 that deals with a modular plug terminated link. And in the next revision of the ISO 11801 standard, that will be added into the configuration. So you will have permanent link, modular plug terminated link, and channel as your wiring configurations for copper. And actually, they're also looking at the same for fiber optics. Key, it uses permanent link. So even though it's got a plug on the end, they're using the limits from the permanent link standard for testing. But you also have a 90 meter design limitation here, just as you did with the permanent link when you're talking about modular plug terminated links. As I said, modular plug terminated links are found in Annex F of 568.2.d-2. Uh, being added to the ISO standards and in particular sections one, three, and six. Now the thing to remember when you're field testing is we have to be able to test the modular plug termination. We have to gauge the workmanship there. So to do that, we can't use a channel adapter. We actually have to use a special adapter and it's the adapter we use for testing patch cords. So to test an MPTL, permanent link lead on one end and a patch cord adapter on the other end of the testing system. So for Fluke Networks, we have patch cord adapters. We have CAT6A patch cord adapters. And reality, where the standards are heading, especially in the 568 uh, standards, around copper, because of power over ethernet, the strong suggestion today is the minimum cabling you should be considering for MPTL is category 6A cabling. And ISO has some similar wording and, and they're fairly strong in their wording in section six of the 11801 standard. ISO requires CAT 6A and CAT 6A only cabling for distributed building systems. So that nicely brings me to power over ethernet. So powering networked devices. And if you consider CCTV cameras and wireless access points hanging off our modular plug terminated link, they're getting their power over the network cabling. So that brings me to the latest power over ethernet standard, and that's the 802.3 VT standard, which allows over 90 watts of energy to be delivered for power over ethernet use. What's driving this is that there are going to be a raft of newer devices that will be networkable. And they need more power than was currently available with the 802.3 AT power over ethernet standard. The BT standard will enable delivery of more energy over a twisted pair cable. It can use all four pairs to deliver power. 
whereas the old standard used two pair, the new standard could use two pair or all four pairs to deliver power. And if they're using all four pairs, they parallel, parallel up the pairs. So in the example I've got here, pair one, two is paralleled with four, five. Pair three, six is paralleled with pair seven, eight. You're gonna have four power supply types. Type one and type two power supplies are two pair. Type three and type four are four pair supplies. Anywhere from four watts up to 90 watts supplied. So that's from the power supply equipment. And what power is required is, to, is negotiated between the powered device, the PD, and the power supply equipment, the PSC. In some cases, that will be the switch. In other cases, it could be a power injector. And if you look at the graphic I have here at the bottom of the screen, I've listed out the different power supply types. So there's four types there. And that gives us eight classes of power over Ethernet delivery. Class one being four watts and class eight being 90 watts. Delivered power is shown down the bottom. So class eight will deliver 71.3 watts to the device over the 100 meter channel. What needs to be noted here is the current flowing. So I see is the current in the conductor, and I've got that listed at the very bottom of the graphic here. And if you look across there at class eight, 90 watts, that's approximately 460 milliamps flowing per conductor. And that's quite a lot of energy. Nominal voltage is 48 to 50 volts. So Ohm's law must be obeyed here. We have current and we have a voltage. So the, there is a resistance. So to get these sort of currents and power levels delivered to the power device, the resistance in your installation must be low. And we have ways of addressing that in revisions to the testing standards. So if you look at the spread of devices that are going to be available under the 802.3 BT standard, you can see what we had in our early days of power over ethernet, the 15 watt devices shown on the left hand side there. As we move to PoE plus 30 watts, we could run more devices that consumed higher currents, more power. And then we have the PoE plus plus at 60 watts, a lot more devices. And now we're out to 90 watts of PoE being uh, provided so we can run monitors, storage, computers and projectors. And some of the computer manufacturers are looking at actually charging the battery from the network cabling. If you consider the, the power brick that a lot of us carry around for our laptops to charge the battery, they're rated at 65 watts. So with 90 watts available down the data cable, it's quite feasible that you could charge the battery in your PCs in years to come. I mentioned resistance earlier on because the key to getting the power delivered is resistance in the cabling. And so we have to look at three resistance readings. We have loop resistance and all four pairs must be below 25 ohms. But because we're using the pairs in what's known as common mode, we have to look a little bit further. And the first measurement we look at is the difference in the resistance of the two wires that make up the pair, because they're sharing the current load flowing through the pair. I've given you the formula there that we use, but 
I think it's important to remember that for field testing, all four measurements from all four pair must be less than 200 milliohm, or that works out to no more than 3% difference between the two wires, or two conductors, if you like. And the symbol across there on the left, RC1, resistance conductor 1, and RC2 is resistance conductor 2. But because we're also running the pairs in parallel, we also need to make certain that the pairs that are being paralleled up share the current evenly as well. So to do that, we look at pair-to-pair -pair resistance unbalance. And basically, we think of the two wires as resistors in parallel to make the pair. And then we, we work out the parallel resistance values. And again, similar formula. We're looking for a measurement of less than 200 milliohms or no more than 7.5% difference between the pairs that are being used to carry the energy. And modern field testers already have these tests available within them. So with resistance unbalance, what does that look like on your field tester? Well, the good thing is it takes no extra time to carry out. And the calculations are handled by the tester for you. So there's no maths to be worried about. But as you can see here from the test results I have, that hundred and that failure there, the basically one ohm of imbalance there is calculated out and that's how it's shown for the pair unbalance. For the pair to pair unbalance, if you look at the two pairs and pair one, two runs parallel with pair four, five, that calculation works out down there at the bottom. So you can see the tester will show you the loop resistance, the pair unbalance, and the pair to pair unbalance. And this will allow you to assess a cable for suitability to carry power over Ethernet. If you don't be careful res with resistance, you can run into a number of problems. Overheating, too much heat, because we all know when cable has resistance, currents trying to flow, that generates heat. Hot cables, you get problems with insertion loss and you can also get problems with return loss. When you have those problems, you don't get your full power down the cable, so you get a power loss. You run out of energy. And when those things start happening, not only does power over Ethernet not work, but you start to get data loss. You're losing packets so that your network throughput goes down. And the key issues here, workmanship and cable quality. They are the main causes of resistance issues. Poor punch down practice or poor quality of cable. Data cable is supposed to be 100% copper. And there are certain companies for, um, that make product that's called copper clad aluminium. Uh, and I've even seen copper clad steel cable, where it's just a very light coating of copper around the outside of the conductor. That's, a, that's dubious for data, but when you're trying to carry current, it definitely isn't going to work. So with power over ethernet, good quality components, quality cable, quality jacks, good workmanship, Check the resistance because you actually need low resistance for the system to work. And from Fluke Networks, we have you covered. 
all our current field testers, the DSX2-8000 and the DSX2-5000 cable analyzers, they're already capable of making those power over Ethernet measurements, as you can see there. We have adapted the standard tests and added a POE after them to designate you're going to doing resistance measurements. And under resistance, if you look at your test results, you see loop resistance, pair unbalance, and pair-to-pair -pair unbalance. And just recently, we introduced a new microscanner. Small handheld tool for POE checking. It's called the microscanner POE. So it can talk to a switch, and it can verify what's available. And as you can see on the graphic there, I'm connected into an outlet that's connected back to a switch. And the switch is telling me it's a class eight capable switch. So it's a type four power supply. Class eight means it's capable of delivering 90 watts of POE. So if you're looking to troubleshoot cable issues or switch configuration issues, or you wanna know, have you got enough energy left on a switch to drive another power over ethernet device? We have the answer for you with the selection of devices available from Fluke Networks. So let's move on and look at testing fiber optics correctly in the data center. Because what you really wanna do is get it right the first time so that your applications work today and you can be ensured that your applications running over your fiber optic cable will work tomorrow, especially when you've got new applications becoming available. Your cabling structure is one of your biggest investments. And as technology changes, you don't want to be updating your fiber optic cables to meet those technology changes. And the key here is testing. Testing is key to getting your applications working. And if you want to look at testing, we break it down into best practices because it's very clear. If you follow best practices for the testing of fiber optic links, they will pass and they will work correctly and the network will perform as it was designed. And the first one there is inspect and clean. And, and the wording in the standard is inspect and clean if necessary and re-inspect if you have cleaned. And I think the point here is inspection is no longer optional. It needs to be carried out. Unless you're inspecting, you don't know a connector is truly clean or not. And as you saw earlier on uh, in some of the single mode, application standards that are becoming available. Reflectance is important and dirty connectors have poor reflectance. It's a must when you're testing with optical loss test sets that you use test reference cords. Patch cords just aren't good enough really. Uh, test reference cords, they're precision manufactured Multi-mode cords have less than 0.1 of a dB loss. Single-mode cords, less than 0.2 of a dB loss. Typical patch cords, 0 0.5, 0 0.7 of a dB in the patch cord. If you remember those channel numbers I showed you earlier for multi-mode and, and single-mode fiber links, you don't want your patch cords taking up most of your budget. So if you're testing, Make certain you're using test reference cords. You've got a far better chance of getting a pass. And importantly, in conjunction with using test reference cords, make certain you're using the correct reference method for the configuration you are testing. In most cases, the preferred method will be the one jumper method, and that's very easy to carry out. I'll have a little bit more on that as we go further into this presentation. But just bear in mind that for some configurations, especially if you're testing MPO trunks, you may need to use the three jumper method. Don't forget an OTDR trace after you've done your optical loss test set testing or your loss testing. 
not instead of. The standards don't recognise OTDR-only testing any longer. That's the premises standards. All premises standards require testing with a light source power meter or an optical loss test set. And then optionally afterwards, an OTDR trace. But the value of an OTDR trace is a list, lets you assess the component performance. Again, single mode fiber, some of those new applications, you've got to look at reflectance. And the OTDR is good for looking at reflectance. But if you're using MPO cassettes, which a lot of people are doing these days, just a point here that document only mode is the best mode for testing. And the reason being the LC connector on the front of a cassette and the MPO connector at the back of the cassette, they're separated by, you know, it varies between manufacturers, but say 150 millimeters of fiber. Yeah, OTDRs have dead zones, half meter, 750 millimeters, thousand, thousand millimeters, one meter. They can't see the two connectors, so they add them together. So you can get fails when, yeah, it's, it's perfectly okay. So I often recommend if you're testing through MPO cassettes, and it doesn't matter whether it's multi-mode or single mode, use a document only mode for testing. And of course, the job's not done to the paperwork's finalized. We see a lot of installations where people don't get the documentation organized correctly. And that's very bad practice. We talked about uh, best practices on fiber optics testing. And the first one was inspection and cleaning if necessary. And that standard is evolving. It started life as the 61-300-335 standard, and it was designed for single fiber connectors. So the idea here was to be able to use a low re resolution microscope or camera to perform the inspection of plugs and adapters. And of course, you could also look at the connectors on test equipment, on, on test cords, and even on networking devices. So very handy. The pass and fail was determined by the number and sizes of scratches and defects within certain zones. When you look at a connector, it's divided into the, the core zone, the cladding zone, and the ferrule zone. To that, we overlay when, when we're doing pass and fail some measurement rings. And those rings correspond to the core zone. And that's inside the yellow area there. You've got the cladding zone between the yellow ring and the green rings. The green rings denote the adhesive zone. And that will always be a little bit ragged and could have a bit of dirt from the way a fiber connector is put together. And inside the blue zone is the a blue ring is the contact zone. Because typically today we use ultra physical contact um, or UPC connectors. In the last revision of the standard, when we moved it up to edition two, we found that the original limits on scratches and defects was a bit tight, so they were relaxed. But importantly, MPO style connectors were now included to the, to the inspection routines. So that you had a methodology of inspecting MPO style connectors. So that enables us to take the inspection a little bit further. And here we have a, a typical image of a, an MPO connector, and this is a raw image. So once we've got a raw image, if we hit the analyze button down the bottom there, bottom center, the tester will go away. And in about 12 seconds, we'll come back and say whether that connector is clean or not clean. And in this case, my connector or 12 fibers are clean and I have a pass. Touch the connector in the middle here and I get back to the graded image. So in this case, I've got all 12 fibers 
centered in my screen. And let's say I'm interested in one of these particular fibers. Let's say fiber six. So I go ahead and touch fiber six and I can bring the image of that fiber. So this is fiber six of 12 on that connector. So it's very easy to inspect an MPO or MTP style connector, whether it be multi-mode or single mode for scratches, defects, dirt, yeah, problems that will stop the transmission from working correctly. Defects are listed as zones. So in the future, the standard will be evolving to the third edition from the second edition we have shown here. Uh, we'll be breaking the four zones down to two zones of interest for connectors. Uh, we have to inspect the ferrules for debris, which that's pretty obvious, especially with MPOs. If you've got some debris on the ferrule, that's going to stop the two connectors from mating. And we have to look a little bit further for dirt out to the 250 micron area. And that applies to single connectors or MPO connectors. So this is why inspection is very, very important. To address inspection and these new requirements, Fluke Networks recently released a new camera and it's called the FI3000 Fibre Inspectra Ultra. And that will allow that level of inspection to take place with the one device. So we can deal with MPO, MTP style connectors or single five fibre connectors with the one camera. And it's available today and will work on our Versive platform. So that's any of our testers. It'll work on the DSX2 series of copper testers. It'll work on the 35 fiber series of testers and it'll work on the OptiFiber OTDR series of testers. What's very nice about the product is it will also work on your smartphone. And as you can see from the image here, here it is on my, um, my iPhone. I can clearly see I have a couple of dirty connectors there on the bottom row. And it works on smartphones or even tablets that use Android or iOS. Uh, readily available from the Apple Store or the Google Play Store. So you can download the application. Uh, the ca camera connects wirelessly to your smart device, run the app, and away you go. You're inspecting and analyzing connectors. And it can be MPO connectors or right down to your standard LC or SC style of connectors. Setting a one jumper reference is very straightforward, very easy to do. We connect the main output to the remote input, remote output to main input, set your reference. Only disconnect from the input. Introduce your tail cord or your receive cord, depending on what your terminology you want to use. Connect all four, four cords together and verify. This is a verification test. You've already set your reference back at step one. Just to check that the cords you're using for measurement are of sufficient quality. So we run a TRC verification test and that all cords mated together, each cord set for multi-mode should be less than 0.15 of a dB or 0.25 of a dB for single mode. So once you've got all the cords buried, very easy to take this the next step. And as you can see here, we're connected up to, to the cassette. We're looking at our first pair. Uh, this is a straight through configuration and we're ready to go. So if we take this out and have a look at, look at it, we're on um, one and two, straight through. We've done our testing. We have our pass. The cable runs 175 feet, a little bit over 50 meters. 
and our losses are quite low, 0 0.78 and 1.1 dB. So once you've made certain everything is clean, and that's key, everything has to be clean. You've now set your reference, verified your cord, and tested your first pair. So all we need to do now is move on to the next pair. Move to the next pair, run our test, got our result, we've saved the result, we move on to the next pair. We'll run to our third pair, we run our test, two and a half seconds later, the tester will come back with the result, we save it, we move on to the next pair. Run our test, we have our result. As you can see, all the fibres in our trunk cable and through our cassettes are fairly consistent. We save the result, move on. Two and a half seconds, we have our result. It actually takes longer to move the connectors than it takes for the tester to actually do the testing. And then we're on to our last pair. So connect it up, run the test. So you can go through 12 fibres very, very quickly. Yeah, it's about two and a half seconds per pair of fibres. So very simple, very straightforward. Get the methodology correct, get everything clean, you will have no problem. And if you do run into a failing fibre, as I've, I've demonstrating here, very easy to see. You can either save that or we have a mode called fix later. You can say, I'll fix that later and come back to that. In this particular case, the fibre's just out a little bit. We're probably dealing with a dirty connector. So it could be just as simple as cleaning here and then moving on. Now, talking about wideband multimode fibre earlier on, or, or what we now refer to as OM5, it's recognised within the standards, both the TIA and the ISO people recognise the fibre type. Its modal bandwidth is 4700 megahertz per kilometre, but it's optimised to support simultaneous communications at multiple wavelengths. So we're using shorter wavelengths, uh, but for testing, it's no different than OM4. A lot of people think we've got to test at all operational wavelengths, and that's incorrect. We still test at 850 and 1300 nanometers. And importantly, to differentiate this fiber away from other multimode fibers, it's designated um, as lime in color, whereas OM4 is Eric Violet, sometimes referred to as Heather Violet, or or that can be aqua like uh, OM3. So for field testing, we treat it the same as OM4. The fibre itself has a loss value of 3 dB per kilometre, but those operational wavelengths are all bound together. So if you're testing at 18, 850 and 1300 nanometres, because of the characteristic of the fibre, if it works at 850 and it passes at 1300, there's no way it's not going to work at the four wavelengths used or typically used on these types of fibre. So you don't have to adapt your testing techniques at all. And talking about MPO MTP based fibre systems, there are a number of options available from Fluke Networks to test these correctly. Modern fibre optic systems are becoming more MPO MPP, MTP style of pre-terminated. Um, Multi-mode and single mode, and you need to remember that single mode uses an APC polish. Uh, 12, 24 core, cores are common. Um, 16, 32 cores are coming. But data speeds achieve using combinations of fiber pairs. And as I mentioned earlier, we refer to those as lanes. So a 12-core trunk 
can offer 8, 10 or 12 fibre connectivity. Uh, and, and by way of example, 40G base SR4 is four lanes, eight fibres, works on OM3 or OM4 fibre in this particular case. And I've got an example there, it's a little bit more complex to test, and, and that's a leaf spline configuration. So MPO, MTP fibre testing, uh, you could use traditional optical loss test systems. Um, you do need an optical loss test system. You need a sophistication of that sort of um, test solution. The approach is a little bit longer because you've, you're changing a, a couple of connections. Um, so you've got to be careful not to make errors. Uh, even with our Certifiber Pro, you just need to pay attention so that you don't get confused as you're changing to the different pairs. So with an optical loss test set, we utilize what's called a breakout cable, or some people refer to it as a hydro cable or a fan out cable. And that allows us to adapt our trunk cable so that our field tester can be used like we're testing through cassettes. You've also got specialized modes on our Certifiber Pro. We can treat the module as one complete module with one loss value rather than as two connectors, which some of the standards do. So when you're using an optical loss test set, you start with a, a three jumper reference. So you set a traditional one jumper reference, break, bring all four cords together and verify them. And this is where we add some extra steps. Once you've verified all four cords, as we have done at the bottom there, we now manually set an extra reference, which removes all four cords and one mated pair of connectors from the measurement. We then introduce a second adapter with calibration cables. Uh, we run a test again to validate the cables and we're still looking for 0.15 dB multimode and 0.25 dB single mode. And provided that requirement is met, you then do a final three jumper reference manually on the tester. So that's removing all four cords connected to the testers and two mated connections. Now these graphics that we're using here for the earlier one for the one jumper method and this one for the three jumper method, we are more than willing to make those available to you. So from there, we connect a Hydra cable or a fan out cable. So as you can see, it looks very similar now to the method we were using with the cassettes in place. So we add our trunk in, which is our trunk cable in place. We've got our through connectors in place and away we go. Now remember we've eliminated the two cords from the main and remote unit and the mated connection pair. So we're really testing the mated pair at either end of the trunk cable. So we're truly testing the trunk with this approach. And again, like last time, just step through. We step through, reach. We get a result as we move along. And then if we have a problem, that'll become very obvious in the test result just here. And as you can see in the, in the graphic, uh, shows uh, two connectors on the outside. They're grayed out, so they've been referenced out. The four cords are grayed out, they've been referenced out. So it shows you we're looking at two connectors in the middle of the dotted uh, area there and some fiber. And that's exactly what we have configured up further when we talk about the trunk cable. There are some changes coming to MPO MTP testing solutions. 
there is a new standard from the IEC covering how to do the testing. It's 61280-4-5. And this talks about using field testers that use MPO interfaces rather than the traditional SC or LC interfaces. And from Fluke Networks, that's the Multifiber Pro. We had to go to a new standard. The current standards treat a cassette as two connectors. Um, so if it means we have a four connector link, our budget number is pretty high to start with. And in this example, I've got a two and a half dB budget. And that's not taking into account the, the fiber loss. So 10 gig will work. It's, you've got 2.6 dB for 10 gig, so that will work. But if you remember when we spoke about 40 gig and 100 gig, on, especially on multi-mode fiber, where we're down at 1.8, 1.9 dB, you've got no guarantee, even though you have a pass, that the link will work. So when you approach these types of systems, you'll find that many of the OEM vendors today, especially the leading ones, have link loss calculators to get around this issue. And when you're using one of these styles of testers, one thing to bear in mind is these testers are testing 12 fibers at a time. So they have 12 light sources and 12 receivers built into them. So they're quite a sophisticated test solution. And when you go down to leaf spine technology, where you have an LC of one end, or 12 LCs, and an MPO connector at the other end, they're difficult to test with a traditional optical loss test set. But with this new form of MPO interface tester, they're quite easy to test. It's just a breakout cable one end, and the MPO goes directly to the tester at the other end. Very easy to, to test. In this particular case, we're using a one jumper method. All 12 fibers are tested simultaneously. So the chances of a technician making an error are significantly reduced. So testing becomes a lot quicker. Typically, around about 20 seconds and you're done for all 12 fibers in this type of testing approach. So setting a reference is as simple as using tried and trusted techniques that we're used to with light source power meters. By using a similar approach, you've got flexibility. You can test a trunk cable in one pass. You can test, test a cassette in one pass. You can use reference style cords. So the whole process of testing the installation is greatly speeded up. And of course, documentation. Good quality testers provide the documentation. For multi-mode, this style of tester, where you have MPO connectors, must still be in circle flux compliant. But in circle flux compliance is done at the bulkhead rather than on the cord. So the cords are typically quite short. Setting a reference, very easy. We're setting 12 references in one hit. So we connect the light source to the power meter and we're setting 12 references as you can see there. We break, we add a known good tail reference call to facilitate the measurement. And one thing to watch here is the cords you're using need to reflect the correct pinning for the trunk under test. So in this case, I am showing pinned uh, connectors. If your trunk is pinned, you will need unpinned cords. And there are gender uh, changeable cords available to facilitate testing where you're moving from pinned to unpinned situations. So you bring the link you are interested in into play. Make certain you're using the right adapters 
not only do you have to worry about pinning and unpinning, but the type of adapters, whether it's key up, key up, or in this example, key down, key up to type to test a type A link. And there's some very good documentation available in the TIA 568.3-D document that talks about the different polarities you can have on MPO and MTP fiber installations. So polarity is important because that allows you to understand what type of cords you need. And if you've got more than 12 fibers, that's not a problem. If you've got 24, we use a Y splitter cable and that allows us to deal with a 24 fiber trunk as two 12 fiber trunks. And just to finish off here, because you shouldn't neglect OTDRs. Most people don't use an OTDR correctly, so let's briefly have a look at that. When you're using an OTDR to measure a link, as I said, most technicians don't do it correctly. Most people, a lot of people neglect to use a launch cord. You have to use a launch cord. You can't see that first connector at the start of the link unless you use a launch cord. And in most cases, people forget to use a towel cord. You should only f leave a towel cord out if you're troubleshooting. Really, to verify that a link is going to work with an OTDR, you should also be using a towel cord. You can see on the right there, I, I have a towel cord. There's, by using a launch cord and a towel cord, at the start of the link, I can see connector one correctly. And at the end of the link, I can see the other connector one correctly because the light goes through and out to the tail cord. If I see a tail cord on the end of my measurement, I know the light has gone past the cassette, which is what I am after. If they do use launch and tail cords, um, most technicians forget to use compensation because you don't want the lengths of the launch and the tail cords being included in the measurement. So OTDR launch and tail compensation removes the effects of those cords. So the measurement you see on the OTDR is just the link you are interested in. And importantly for premises cabling, a lot of people are still doing single-ended testing, whereas both the TIA and the ISO standards actually require you to do testing from both ends of the link and, the av and to average out the two results. And if you're using one of our OTDRs like the OptiFiber Pro I have depicted here, if you set it up correctly, it will automatically calculate the average of the two measurements that you need. And as I said, don't forget your documentation. You want robust test reports to prove that things have been cor tested correctly. And if I take a fiber optic link on my test report here, I've got an image of the end faces so I can see the connectors are clean. That little speck of dirt there is way out of scope. It's, it's not in any area that plays a part in transmission. So that's not important. Underneath, I can see my insertion loss for the fiber. And again, this is single mode. So I've got 1310 and 1550. And importantly below that again, I can see what networking standards will actually work on the fiber that I've just had installed. I followed my optical loss measurement with an OTDR measurement. So here's the result for my OptiFiber OTDR. I can see my link, my launch and tail cord. They're greyed out to show that I'm using launch and tail compensation. 
And, and what's important here, I can see the two connectors and I have a reflectance value on those two connectors. The connectors are low loss and the more negative that reflectance value, the cleaner the connector is. And I'm well above the limits that some of the new standards require. And just for thorough documentation, the report will also give you the traces so you can analyze it yourself and see the settings of the OTDR that were used to make these particular measurements. So to conclude today's webinar, standards are changing rapidly at the moment. Higher speeds are occurring very quickly compared to the past. You know, the last six fibre speed changes or network speed changes happened within 18 months. The previous six speed changes occurred over 35 years. So that's how quickly we're accelerating networking. So you are going to want to be using higher speeds, but you need to ask yourself, will your network su support these faster speeds? Remember your fiber optic cabling and your copper cabling are the foundation that your network runs on. If you have a poor foundation, no matter how well you build something, it will be let down by the poor foundation. So make certain what it, your cabling can support the speed you're going to need to use. And to match evolving network standards, structured cabling standards are also evolving. Make certain your test equipment can support these changes. Make certain your test equipment can support the new link models that are coming into play and that they can, that your equipment can support the new connector types that we'll start seeing. If you're running power over ethernet and it's going to play a larger part in networking, will your copper plant be able to support power over ethernet? Are your resistances low enough? And if you're getting new cabling installed, make certain you ask the installation company to do resistance balance tests as part of their certification routine. And it goes without saying, make certain fiber optics are tested correctly. And if you remember the earlier slide on the best practices, follow those steps, make certain everything is clean, Use test reference cords. Make certain you use the right reference methodology and you will get good fiber optic test results. And make certain you document everything. As I said, the job's not complete until you've done your documentation. Well, that's all I have for you today. I hope you found this webinar informative. If you should have any questions for us, the email address is shown there, hpacmarketing at flutenetworks.com. So I thank you for your attention today and hope to catch you next time when I have a chance to present information on standards changes and Fluke Networks equipment.